Have you ever seen pictures of people living in scorching hot tropical regions without air conditioning and wondered how do they do it? Don't underestimate the impact of natural ventilation. In this video, you'll learn how to naturally get fresh, cool air flowing through your home without AC or fans how to use water to lower the temperature around and in your home, and simple design strategies to keep the sun's heat off windows and walls. Hey, I'm Christina, and I'm a sustainability consultant who creates sustainable holistic spaces. And in this series, we'll explore low carbon natural building methods to create structures that save energy and exist in harmony with the environment. A lot of the tips I'm about to share are best incorporated during the design stage when you're actually planning your building. But if your property is already built, you'll still find plenty of useful tips in this video. Also, just a quick disclaimer, if you live in a hot and humid climate, some of these techniques may be less effective due to your high humidity. You may need mechanical dehumidification alongside these passive cooling methods to really maximize their effectiveness. Okay, let's get started. Passive cooling tip number one is moving air. This is a big topic and it all starts with pressure zones. They're massively important in how air moves within and around a building. Low pressure zones are areas where the air is less dense, it's lighter and the molecules spread far apart and so this happens when air is heated. And we all know that heat rises, right? Well, it rises into a low pressure zone. High pressure zones are areas where the air is denser and more compressed. This can happen due to cooler temperatures. If hot air rises, cooler air is going to stay lower in a high pressure zone. High pressure zones can also occur because of forces like wind. If the wind blows on one side of the building, it creates a high pressure zone on that side. And then on the other side, a low pressure zone is automatically formed. And air always wants to flow from high pressure space to a low pressure one. So what does that mean? It means if we position a building to take advantage of prevailing winds, air is always gonna be flowing around the structure. Now let's talk about the stack effect because it's a great example of the pressure zones in action. The stack effect is what we get when hot air rises in a building and it rises into a low pressure zone, leaving this kind of vacuum below a high pressure area where cool air flows in. So the cool air comes in below, it heats up and it rises and it pulls in that fresh supply of cool air. And now we've got airflow. And so that's the stack effect. You can design your building by stacking windows at different heights and with larger openings at the bottom and smaller openings at the top. And now you've got a natural ventilation system that keeps air moving through your home without mechanical ventilation. A few other examples of the stack effect are atriums and ventilation shafts. And these are simple design features that make space for hot air to rise and escape. Solar chimneys, which are basically the same thing, but they're designed to heat air and keep that stack effect working. And finally, I've got to talk about breezeways. A breezeway is usually designed like an open passage or a corridor between parts of your building although it can take other forms, it's aligned with the prevailing winds. So the wind hits one side of your building, a low pressure zone forms on the other side of the building itself or the interior of the building. This low pressure zone pulls the air either around the building or in through open windows. So that keeps air moving through your home. So speaking of moving air through your home, let's talk about cross ventilation. I know cross ventilation seems super straightforward. Just open windows on opposite sides of the room and the airflow will cool things down, right? Well, yes, but also no. 
With cross ventilation, our goal is to invite the air to move throughout the interior space. And so design plays a role here. If the windows are directly across from one another, the wind will just blow in a straight line from one side of the room to the other. It doesn't necessarily cool the whole room. Instead, you try to stagger the location and the size of the windows on opposite or adjacent walls. So for example, you could open windows that are on, on a diagonal from one another. And this kind of encourages the air to move around the room. And this brings me to our second tip for passive cooling by design. Passive cooling tip number two is working with water. Water absorbs heat, which lowers the temperature in the surrounding air. So we can use water in our designs to naturally reduce the heat. And I don't mean you have to run a sprinkler all the time. These are sustainable ways to use water, even if you live in a hot and dry climate. So first, there's evaporative cooling. If we put water features near windows or in courtyards, they can help cool the air as it enters the building. We can do this with things like pools and fountains. Green roofs are another option, and these are also called living roofs. Uh, green roofs is covered with living plants, right? And so green roofs actually hold water in their soil, and they can be designed with water retention systems, but they basically cool the building below. Another way to cool with water is radiant cooling. If you're familiar with radiant heating, where heat is distributed through the floor with pipes and tubes, radiant cooling will make a lot of sense. Cool water flows through tubes in the ceiling to absorb the heat from the space below. Okay, so far we've talked about passive cooling with airflow and with water. Now let's touch on a third way we can design passive cooling into our buildings. It may sound basic, but I see so many architects and designers fail to account for it. Passive cooling tip number three is shading. Shading is one of the simplest and most effective ways to reduce solar heat gain. It's classic for a reason. A lot of us think about using buildings for shade, but we may not think about shading the building itself but it can make a huge difference. So here are three shading techniques that you can use to keep your home cooler. One is overhangs and shade structures. So design overhangs to cover all your windows during the hot summer months. If you live in an extremely hot region, consider shading all the walls. Two, Western sun protection. The afternoon sun is often the hottest, so minimizing western facing windows is a great idea. You can also use deep porches or build structures to shade that side of the building. And three, plant deciduous trees and vines. Planting these to the west gives you shade in the summer, and then in the winter, when the leaves fall, it lets in sunlight. Those three approaches, working with air pressure zones, using the power of water and shading your building go a long way for keeping your home comfortable without relying too heavily on mechanical cooling systems. I actually have a lot more to say about passive cooling that goes beyond the scope of this video. I shared even more tips in my in-depth article uh, on my journal, so you'll find that in the link below. It includes more ways to cool with water, which building materials help keep your home cool, how the orientation of your building can keep it cool, using underground cooling tubes, how to use wind catchers, which are a design feature that ancient civilizations use to keep cool, and a ton more. So along with the article, you'll find links in the description to even more resources that can help you create a passive home, including a super popular passive heating and cooling checklist. And that's gonna do it for today. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Tap the notification bell so you never miss a video about natural building and resilient property design. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.